Yeah, so welcome everybody to the first ever um, APAC Container webinar as part of our Container Cloud Fest series. Um, today's topic will be reliability engineering in the enterprise, anti-fragility at the core of continuous innovation. So before we start, just some minor housekeeping. Um, you will be have the chance to ask questions at the end, so um, make sure you keep those questions. And what you can also do is use the questions box to actually type in your questions so that we can get back to them by the end of the uh, webinar. And you can also use the chat functionality to kind of discuss various things uh, as we go as well. A quick introduction. Uh, my name is Yun Zi Lin. I am the Director of Innovation as well as the Chief Innovation Officer for Container APAC. And um, I've spent 18 years in the technology industry across um, various governments, um, enterprises, as well as uh, the private sector. And um, fun, fun fact was that back in 2016, I managed to actually turn down the Google SRE manager job three times because the SRE book in 2016 hasn't come out yet and I didn't know where SRE was and how times have changed. So now, nowadays I spend a lot of time consulting reliability and DevOps um, along with sort of Michael uh, to the enterprise. I was actually one of the fourth members uh, of Container APAC in the early days and now we have over about 140 people. So it was quite exponential growth for us and um, I'm really glad to be here sharing our learning with you. Yeah, thanks, Yun. Uh, my name is Michael Ewald. So I'm the Director of Engineering at Contino. Uh, my background is virtually from startup to enterprise into government. Uh, about 20 years in tech, uh, it, it's really gone from software engineering. Also did a fair amount of time in environment management. Uh, and then I spent some time as operations manager and I, I guess that's where uh, SRE for me became a necessity. Uh, it's interesting actually being an environment manager because when you want to automate the use of environments, you realize it's it's probably more hectic than production because uh, you're getting regular untested changes. And it, I actually credit a lot of the upskilling that I had in that space because you had to get across a lot of tech a lot quickly, uh, understand full systems integration. So it set me up to uh, to be um, set up for success, I think, for SRE. Uh, yeah, and I've been Contino, I think, for about 10 months now. And previous to that, uh, my last gig was CBA, where I was looking after all the big data analytics platforms. And I, I'll share a few stories, a few more stories as we go through, and I'll mix them in with some other organizations as well. Sounds good. So a bit about Contino, um, some of you might know us, some of you might not. So we basically work with the world's kind of leading brands, uh, heavily regulated enterprise, to do what's called what we call the measurable transformation where we pretty much baseline across DevOps, SRE maturity, data ops maturity, and then we would then be able to implement measurable sort of incremental transformational changes in those organizations through the adoption of enterprise DevOps, cloud native computing, and data. Um, we have grown to about 400 people globally, uh, recently acquired by Cognizant, and uh, we have five global offices across the world. Um, there's been five, more than 500 engagements in kind of heavily regulated enterprise which makes us one of the more referenceable sort of DevOps as well as uh, reliability engineering consultancies out there in the world. Um, some of the kind of notable brands, um, you can see we have NAB, Allianz, Origin, Jetstar, Medibank, Transport for New South Wales, really covering a wide spectrum across the enterprise, the government um, sectors. So today we're gonna talk about not so much the DevOps between the developments and operations, but we're actually going to talk about innovation and reliability. Um, it's quite interesting, isn't it, Michael? When we talk about innovation, we often find on client sites, the reliability is just as important to actually drive the innovation. Yeah, 100%, because uh, we want to innovate because we want to find those benefits, but unless you have reliability, you're never going to truly unlock those benefits. Yeah, and especially kind of with the recent crisis around COVID, there, there has been kind of um, a high high imperative to actually innovate. But then at the same time, you also have to offer reliability of service. So what we're going to touch on today is I will start off with why do we need to innovate in Australia? Um, and when you do kind of feel the need to innovate, how do you actually go about with innovation? And then how do you actually tie innovation and reliability together? And then it's over to Michael to talk about the reliability. 
Yeah, so again, reliability, uh, I guess in this talk for the reliability part, we really actually want to sort of take a, deep, a bit of a dive into the data element as well. Uh, for when you're innovating, it, it, it's great. And, and I think there's a lot of great work. In fact, uh, Carlos Nuance uh, gave a great webinar talk just uh, the other week uh, around how to boost your apps with an SRE approach. Uh, it really covers off the, the, the platform and application, but we, we sometimes forget about the data and it's unique and it's actually key for innovation. So Ewan's going to talk around some aspects of data use, but to make it reliable, we're going to dive a little bit deeper around how to make that possible. And I'm going to probably share some secrets from experiences I had around where to focus uh, and where you actually want to have things like observability really come into its own. Yeah, it sounds exciting. Let's uh, get right into it. So why do we need to innovate? It's really this theory around creative disruption. So the term creative disruption was coined by Joseph Schumpeter. Um, and uh, he was basically describing this idea that the industries will always revolutionize to, to really kind of destroy old ideas in order to make room for new ones. Um, and this process of creative disruption is an essential fact about capitalism. And um, we might kind of think in Australia, we really are in a lofty country, right? We've got a very sort of strong financial, uh, financial services industry, and we also have very strong mining industry. So, you know, maybe the creative disruption doesn't really apply to us. However, it's very interesting because we see a lot of statistics from out of the US, but if we actually look at our own backyard um, out of the ASX 200, that that should be quite a substantial amount of listings in the ASX 200 that are coming in every year, which means that other listings are being replaced. So if we look at from January 2013, there was 23 new listings, um, which means that come new year in January 2013, there was actually 23 companies uh, or listings that has dropped off from the, the index. And then that had increased to 24, 27, and 34 in February 2016. And then slowly it kind of came back to 20 and then it's gradually on the increase again. So what this is actually showing that, showing us is this idea of creative disruption not only applies in the ASX uh, 200 uh, in Australia, but it's actually increasing gradually, right, as well. So we're not as safe from sort of disruption and innovation as, as we thought we were. And what about those mining industry and what about the financial industry? So let's talk, look at those numbers. Oh, actually, before we do that, <laughs> we're actually gonna have a look at some of these new listings that I talked about um, between 2013 and 2000, um, 2020. So, well, back in 2012, a lot of these companies either didn't exist or they were not on the index for ASX 200. Companies such as Afterpay, uh, Car Sales, Domain Group, uh, Zero, um, Appen, which is an AI um, company, uh, Real Estate um, Group, uh, Technology One, NextDC, and Old Media. Right. Uh, one thing you might find with all these companies that they have all had in common is that they all have something to do with technology, right? And if we look at the companies that have dropped off uh, since 2012, well, we got Myers uh, due to poor performance and diminishing returns. They, they lost in market capitalization and dropped out in 2018. Uh, Fairfax Media actually merged with the nine MSN group. And they are still trading as a domain group, but the Fairfax brand is no longer there, which again shows that sort of transition away from the traditional media into the digital media in the, in the form of domain group. Um, Seven West Media has dropped off in 2019. Um, CapCharge and Art and Leisure are not doing so well. CapCharge being the sort of traditional um, payment system for taxi industries and Arden Lesher, who is the owner of Dreamworld. Uh, what's interesting is Slater Gordon has also dropped off in 2016. So Slater Gordon being sort of one of the top performing lawyer companies uh, in Australia. Well, I mean, lawyers actually, when you think about it in terms of disruption, is actually one of the most sort of um, industry that's holding on to the, the traditional ways of doing things. And they haven't really moved into the whole digital space at all. Uh, and Dulux has, uh, on a merger. So a lot of these companies are still around. They simply kind of due to corporate actions or various forms of uh, reinventing themselves, they have dropped off in the ASX and reinvented themselves. Either they had done that or they had just dropped off the index altogether. So let's look at the shift from kind of around 2015 to January uh, to now, right? January 2020. Um, and what I'm showing you is actually the sort of growth um, or decline in percentage value uh, from it comparing 2015 to 2020. What's interesting is that what we always saw to be the pillar of our sort of financial system with the, with the banks 
is actually on the decline, right? So it's actually around 21% decreasing uh, since 2015 to 2020. Uh, what's quite interesting is that we're actually getting a around 281% increase in the information technology sector. And if you combine that with the media industry, such as um, Domain Group and realestate.com, uh, it's actually almost accounts of about 300% increase in the total sort of growth uh, in the various sectors, uh, purely accounted for information technology and um, media in the entertainment. It's also worth noticing that on the far left-hand side, the consumer discretionary spending has increased by 50% um, in, in the sector performances, as, as well as healthcare, right? So what you're looking at is it's really like a five-year trend from 2015 to 2020. And you might be wondering to yourself, well, then how, how did COVID affect us, right? So first of all, you know, the, the picture that we're painting here is very different to the traditional view that uh, the resource sector and the financial sector will always save us uh, in the market, because we can see this is definitely a, quite a significant pivot in the market growth. Um, well, things have changed yet again with COVID because um, due to the fact that uh, we all have to self-isolate, there's actually a massive uh, increase in consumer staples. So things like grocery deliveries, um, online shopping, whereas consumer discretionary has decreased, like uh, entertainment, gambling is actually decreasing. Uh, healthcare is obviously on the way up. Information technology is still increasing. And what's interesting is that telecommunication services as well as utilities, which were declining on, on a uh, previous five year pattern, is actually increasing again. So what you can see here is that the Australian market is actually not as static as it seems, and it's actually quite dynamic, and who knows what will happen after COVID, right? So how do you actually prepare your organization to, to remain innovative and uh, get ahead of the change of pace? Because something like this could happen again, and then you might need to pivot your initiatives to be able to stay stay ahead of the game. So hopefully, kind of based on these sort of numbers, I have convinced you that the creative destruction, the destroy, a destruction of old ideas and to make room for the new ideas is actually quite real. Um, so how do you actually innovate then? So if there is a, such a need to innovate, um, what, what's the framework to do that? At the end of the day, I think a lot of organizations look for what's called a competitive advantage, but according to Jeff Bezos, that doesn't exist. The only sustainable sort of competitive advantage is really around agility, right? So whatever you do today, someone else would replicate it or copy it, or the market would shift, as you have seen in the graphs I presented. Um, so right now we're living in volatile times and the only way to compete is to be agile. And we've observed kind of various clients that we work with who have innovated, whether, whether it be kind of digital transformation, moving to the cloud, mm -hmm. uh, new sort of um, uh, experiences, kind of moving from channels such as traditional B2B into B2C. Uh, these are the sort of three steps that we have identified that that's really kind of proven to be quite successful to to allow you to adapt and um, turn prices into opportunity as well as optimize the single key metric that matters when it comes to innovation and agility, which is time to value. Okay, so the first step is actually to get really close to your customers. Um, a lot of our sort of traditional clients with B2B are all moving to that B2C space. They kind of cut, um, cutting through the middleman, uh, whether it be advisors or um, uh, other institutions, they're going straight to their customers. And to be able to do that, they have to optimize that value stream to actually start from the customers and work backwards to their supply chain, to the suppliers, to the vendors. And, and sometimes these organizations are actually totally rethinking their boundaries, right? So instead of sticking with their traditional product silo, they're going beyond either by joining up with partnerships or, or other means of grabbing data from other different sources to be able to provide the sort of service that their customers truly need. Okay, I mean, here's actually an example of two companies that are actually innovating uh, in, in, during the, the coronavirus uh, crisis. And this just goes to show that innovation is not just about technology, right? It's actually about how do you, whether incrementally or radically, improve yourselves to solve, solve real customer problems, right? Um, I'm not sure if you have seen this, uh, this sort of website where you actually get in the queue to go to a website. So you might be kind of going out to do some online shopping, whether it's buying groceries or buying um, kind of uh, consumable toys, and you end up hitting a website where it tells you that you're in the queue before you can actually go and buy anything. Um, I think, see, this is, a, this is kind of tackling the innovation problem from a pure technology perspective, because it's solving the problem of, I want to have a stable website, 
Whereas on the right hand side, what you have is uh, Harris Farms actually delivering products to your door with a very clear ETA and the SLA so that you know how to plan your time as well as your dinner around when the grocery will arrive. So they've gone beyond just building out a website that is stable. They've actually got, well, no, customers don't want stable websites to do online shopping. They want to know a guaranteed time when the delivery will come and so that they can you know, not be starving when the kids are screaming and shouting. Right. It's, it's that taking that extra step to get closer to the customer. Um, I'm, I'm part of the 2020, right? If you have to have a queuing system for your website, um, it's, you know, it's not a good look. <laughs> so, so this is where we kind of um, came to the conclusion that, well, innovation starts with the customer's job to be done, right? The reason why we introduce this terminology is because the job is really describing the progress that the individual tries to make in a particular circumstance. So when I'm self-isolating, I have a job to be done, which is to feed my kids, and I need to do that in a timely fashion. I cannot do that when I have to queue up in the website, or if I give a rough time estimate of this grocery would arrive between today and tomorrow because I got no dinner for tonight. Um, it's, it's also very different because it's looking at the causation of why a customer will purchase and use a particular product um, instead of a correlation. Because sometimes when we talk about being customer focused, um, a lot of companies will straight away go to the marketing department and start looking at customer personas. But that has yet uh, proven yet and yet again, uh, personas actually doesn't tell you the causation. It gives you the correlation. For example, Michael, do you go to the gym, Michael? I do. Do you have a gym membership? Look like it. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> you do, right? Um, but for someone like me, I have a very different persona to Michael, but I also want to go to the gym. I also want to get fit. So. Does that mean that because I'm a different persona, therefore I do not want to go to the gym? That's not necessarily true, right? Michael and I are very different personas, but we do both want to go to the gym. And while Michael might have a gym membership, I might just watch fitness videos and work out at home with my kids. So the, the job is the same, right? The job is always there. I want to get fit. I want to look healthy and I want to feel healthy. And, um, and that's a progress I want to make with my life. And Michael also has that same desire to make progress. And it's that desire to make progress in your lives that differentiates us as human beings away from the animals. Because animals don't actually necessarily make progress in their life. They can't continue on with the same pattern. And as a, as a customer to a gym, well, it's not the gym membership that they want, right? The gym membership is only one way to get the job done. There's also other means to get the job done. So during the crisis, in the, in the case of, say, self-isolation, a gym instructor is a coach. It's actually not there to sell gym membership. If the gym instructor thinks of himself or herself as a coach, well, they, they can still get the same job done by coaching remotely, right? So once we kind of get out of the mindset of sort of correlations and personas, we kind of think about the job that the customer is trying to achieve. It actually allows us to innovate a lot more accurately and find out the root causes of what, why a customer would buy a certain product. Um, and what I'll give you now is a few examples of company who really truly understand the job to be done and you can see it in the way they work, right? For example, I was talking to Ray White um, just not, not too long ago. And it's interesting that they started doing online auctions. Um, and they told me that they will continue to do online auctions even after the crisis is over, because guess what? There's more people attending online auctions than physical auctions, right? Because the job to be done for a buyer is that they just want to buy a property. They don't want to sit around, stand around with lots of people and agents kept harassing them to buy. They want to actually do it from the comfort of their own home. That was, that's the job. Um, if they can do it by online auction, they actually prefer to do that. And you end up with more people bidding because it's online now. Um, the next example is NAB. Um, you look at the NAB website around sort of mortgages, it's actually not talking about loans because people don't want loans. Right. People have a job. They want to make progress in upgrading their home so that the family can enjoy a better lifestyle. And you can actually see that the message is very strong. It's actually about what is your story of progress. It's actually perfectly aligning to the job to be done philosophy. It's not talking about what home loan can we give you? Can we give you an offset account and credit card? Right. Um, because those are products. The product is relevant to the job. And there's many different ways to get the job done. Whereas if you understand the customer's need for the progress, you can give them a much more tailored product. And afterpay, I mean, afterpay is, is a verb now, right? It's a bit like Xerox. Um, I want to afterpay it. It's not about four equal monthly payments after you buy. It's about that I do want to afterpay so that 
I don't need to worry about the hassles of a credit card. And again, like if you look at these scenarios, it's actually not about the persona, right? If you think about Afterpay, it's not about appealing to millennials, it's appealing to anybody who don't want a credit card, right? If you think about like um, a home loan, it's not about homeowners, it's about anybody who wants to either upgrade the lifestyle by buying a home or upgrading the home. Um, and in terms of Ray White, it's not about people who want to go to auctions, right? It's not, it's, it's not a certain persona that makes people go to auctions. It's the fact that, you know, there is a job to be done, and if you can make it easier and less, more, uh, more frictionless, they will definitely go for those online options. Okay, so now that you have identified the sort of customer job to be done, it's actually time to think about how do you optimize the value stream? And kind of we see this time and again, isn't it, Michael, that companies will actually start building first before they actually understand the customer? Yeah, 100%. And what we're proposing is actually follow the Amazon way, right? Amazon is a very proven sort of company who have succeeded, innovated yet time and time again, and they're always kind of keeping ahead of the customer's uh, expectations by releasing new products. And the way they work is actually they work backwards. So they actually don't work by writing code first and then trying to sell it. They actually start with the press release, which is a marketing document. So to test out the viability of the product, the pitch, Right, so they actually start with the sell, and then they start. Then they, they move to the FAQ stage, which they scrutinize the product idea to see uh, whether there's existing data to support the claim, whether there's existing products out there, whether there's existing duplicate products within Amazon ecosystem. Right, it's actually really kind of scrutinizing on the feasibility of the product before moving to the visuals. Right, uh, the visuals, which is about customer experience and desirability. Um, and kind of keeping it at a very high level so that people don't get caught up on being pixel perfect, but on the overall storytelling of the product. So we can see here is really kind of combining that viability, feasibility, and desirability uh, before you actually write a single line of code, right? Because it might seem time consuming, but this is actually a very optimal value stream. And we do this with our clients as well. And kind of Michael, you can also fair testimony for this is that we can deliver a lot of products within three months because we do this working backwards process. Okay, so with the product stream uh, optimized based on the customer job to be done, you might think, well, you know, we don't have the resources, we don't have the capacity, and it's not part of our line of business. Well, it's time to rethink that, right? In, in this sort of open data ecosystem that's slowly emerging in Australia, with kind of consumer data, right? The sort of API ecosystem, um, open banking, open data, uh, open energy as well as open telco. There's actually room for you to think about, you can actually step beyond your product vertical, right? You can actually reach out into other sectors data as long as you gain consent from the customer and to be able to bring them more customized products. Because at the end of the day, a person living in a, uh, in a house, they might have multiple needs. They might have multiple jobs to be done. And they, they might need someone to actually combine those customer journeys together to give them a holistic end-to-end -end aggregated product. And something uh, that um, I will have to ask you around, uh, something CBA has done recently, Michael, is actually to use the data to actually give a very tailored product that's actually outside the existing product line. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, why is it CBA? It's renowned. They've won awards around the world for their recommendation and personalization aspects to Combank Camp. But not only that, they've recently been working with the government for unclaimed benefits as well. So again, it's it's reaching out to other data areas and bringing that in and, and, and broadening the, the boundaries of the service offering. But again, when you think about what their job they've done, what their, their mission statement is, is really to improve the financial well-being of their customers. So they're really looking at that to drive the new innovation for the Combank app. Indeed, and once that, that, that's kind of really true to the idea of think about the job and not, not necessarily be restricted by the product, right? And, um, and you can reflect on your own organization, you must have a lot of data and think about all the other data sources that you can combine with your data set to give that better recommendation and personalized um, offering. Uh, rethink your boundaries, right? So think about like, if you're not doing last mile delivery, if you have a product out there that needs to be delivered, there are partners out there, right? Such as the one that Harris Farm use, which is Fleety. Uh, there's also companies like Drive Yellow, which kind of do can do the uh, real time uh, updates with the last, last mile delivery for you. Uh, think about your existing cloud partners, such as Amazon, which can actually help your workforce uh, with scalable virtual desktop, which can scale up and down based on your demand. 
and we have case studies and webinars on this as well. You can check it out on CloudFest. Uh, think about how to actually deliver that consistent customer experience without having the bottleneck of a call center, right? Your call center must be hammered right now. Think about that on channel chatbot experience across voice and web, which can you, you can build on top of Amazon Connect, right? So these are the partnership and kind of think about your existing partnership in a different light on the offering that they can provide you to give you that better customer experience. All right, so now it's kind of like, we talked about innovation, the need for innovation, how you innovate by working backwards from the customer, but where does reliability come in? Well, when you think about it, it's actually, it's only when you combine innovation and reliability is when you actually can get to the stage of continuous innovation. Site reliability engineering is also about working backwards, right? Because you start from your customer, your SLA is defined by the customer, which affects your organization. And based on your organization sort of SLA, you would then um, create various service level objectives to meet the SLA. And um, once you have that defined, you will then go to the engineering level to actually figure out what are the server level indicators that allows you to meet the service level objective to deliver on the service level agreement to your, um, to your customer. So if we were to map this out, right? So I'm using a technique called Wadley mapping. And hopefully this will kind of paint you a picture of where the innovation and reliability fit together. The customer has a job to be done. They have an expectation, which is essentially SLA. It can be either written or not or, or verbal, but they, they have an expectation out there. And they're out there stuck with a competing product, which is not so great, right? It's not so, it's not really delivering on the SLA they need and it's custom built, so it's not very commoditized. Customers want to sort of commoditize repeatable products, which meets the SLA. And you come along with your innovation team, you think about a product that can potentially meet the SLA, but you're also custom building at the same time, right? But in the process of doing that, you might run a few design sprints for a few POCs, but slowly you chip that into a product that they can use with a guaranteed sort of server level objective. And guess what? The customer will now change over to your product because it makes their job to be done a lot closer than the competing product. But to be able to continuously deliver on the reliability need of those SLOs, you probably need a website which has SLI, a server level indicator. And that website uses a CDN to guarantee availability instead of a queuing system, um, and that uses the cloud. And you also have API to kind of give all the products um, into the websites, and that uses the cloud as well. And you hit up a delivery partner to do the last mile delivery for you, which you then manage SLA on their side, um, which also uses the cloud. And to make things better, you give recommendations, which also have its own SLIs and using a CRM in the cloud. And now you have the sort of that sort of reliability foundation. And what happens is, is that your SRE team actually not only have to look after your own SLIs of your system to meet your own SLO, it has to look after the aggregate SLIs of all your downstream vendors as well. And Michael will be able to touch on uh, more around the IP that we have built to help you do that in, in his um, slides. And you continuously innovate on the left-hand side as well. So really the focus is around while you continuously innovating on the top left-hand corner, you must maintain the reliability uh, of your core product as well as your downstream vendors to be able to continuously deliver on the customer expectation and pass the happiness test. Okay, so let's go back to our original um, statement. The prerequisite to innovation is reliability because creative disruption is real and time to value is the only metric that matters and agility is your only competitive advantage, right? But how fast is too fast? You want to go fast, but where does reliability come in and what sort of metrics and what sort of data do you need to be able to um, continuously deliver fast reliably? And that's where Michael will come in. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Yun. And yes, you're right. Reliability is a prerequisite to successful innovation. So the reason for that is, as Yun explained, for you to have those great benefits, there's lots of innovation, lots of different scenarios that Yun showed, but they provide benefits. But if your service is not sustainable and reliable during that runtime, you'll never get to unlock those benefits. So the good job, uh, what I love about working in Contino is I get to talk to lots of companies and organizations and get to talk to them a bit about SRE and around support and run cloud operating models. Uh, and I think more and more uh, companies are starting to understand why SRE practices are important. SRE gives you a, a way to implement a set of practices that can deliver the required outcomes. 
outcomes you need to actually run a set of services. So it's not as easy as just reading the O'Reilly handbook or, or the workbook and just roll out a new operating model. A lot of companies are just not like Google. It, it, it takes time. So at Casino, we've discovered a few different models that we've worked with customers to transition teams to develop SRE practices within their organization. Now, there are factors to consider such as the amount of Zex sponsorship you have and the capability of the teams you work with. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Now, applying SRE practices into the data space can be a bit harder than normal platforms. It's probably because they can get very complex. And, and as I mentioned before earlier, I'm probably going to pivot into the data space a bit more than just your platforms and, and your applications. I think there's enough information out there for that. Uh, and then when you throw in continuous innovation into the mix, you better have a plan. Well, strap yourselves in because we're about to have a look at how data fits into the SRE world and why DRE needs special attention. So if software is eating the world, one second. If software is eating the world, then data is a gravy on top. The only problem is with the rate of which we're collecting and consuming data, that plate is overflowing and has a potential to make a real mess. So we need to look at several aspects of data. Firstly, as Yun highlighted earlier, we use data in new innovative approaches. Uh, and, and like using data to drive decisions such as recommendations or providing personalization, there's also another use. We can actually use that data to, for internal operational use. Uh, again, I, I highly recommend if you look at one of our other webinars from, uh, from Carlos, talking around boosting your, your apps, uh, you'll see the use of that data to drive particular decisions. But also too, you can use that data for identifying productivity or risk or, or, or support issues that you may have not known before. Because you see, why it's important is the speed at which you can actually get data and make it available is the speed at which decisions can be made. Now, data is real IP. However, we have to know that we can trust our data in order for it to be valuable. Just think about personalized recommendations or using data to automate your price points for customers. If you get that wrong, that has non-trivial impacts. So you need to make sure that that data is accurate, timely, and complete. So, right, so, thank you. Here I want to touch a bit around complexity. And complexity can become a problem as your data systems and ecosystems start to grow. So, there's a common scenario called drifting into failure. And this way you need to think a little bit differently with data reliability engineering. It's not just the data platforms themselves. More importantly, you need to think about the data pipelines. What are the weaknesses? What are the failure points? What are the potential impacts for the priority of those impacts? So as your data grows, complexity will inevitably creep in. And before you know it, the amount of complexity of those data pipelines can get very big. The image you can see on your right there, it, that's actually a very clean dependency data lineage diagram. And it's probably only a fraction of the size that I've personally managed and seen in other organizations as well. Now the book I'm highlighting here, uh, it's a book called Drift Into Failure by a psychologist named Sidney Decker. It has some very applicable insights when it comes to dealing with complex environments. So I'll bring it back to innovation. So Yun, how often have you seen changes from new innovation seamlessly integrate into your environment without adding to the overall end-to-end -end complexity? Almost never. Yeah, it's pretty hard. So I came across this book accidentally uh, and I found it very useful as it goes over the, some of the failures that can happen in very highly complex yet highly regulated and tested verticals like the airline industries, for example. Uh, it's, it's hard to argue that airlines are probably the, one of the most highly regulated, audited and tested industries in the world, yet planes occasionally crash. So he goes into some details and if I was to summarize the, the, the gems uh, that I gleaned from this particular book on, on the topic, it's that even if you test and monitor the hell out of your services, don't forget about the end-to-end -end relationships. You see, this is what really got me folks applying this into the data area. It's data and information that it gets exchanged between different silos. And if you go back to that chart that Yun showed earlier around you have a need to commoditize, let's say, your, your cloud platform to the vendor, you still have telemetry and, and instrumentation that you need to read in order to have an end-to-end -end service. So how do you cater for that? Especially in, in, in organizations where you have teams in upstream systems that don't even you never interact with within your organization. This is where you can typically drift into failure. 
And this is where resilience engineering and DRE comes into its own to monitor and keep track of its own adaptions. So as an organization, you need to become aware and remain aware of those changes. You need to be first to know. So we, we and again, we're gonna pivot this for the need for innovation. I think COVID-19 COVID has shown us, that especially in the workplace, we're forced to innovate at high speeds. So we need to make sure that we understand all the impacts and flows of information that that innovation brings us as well. So I apologize. Uh, I'm gonna give a quick language warning here. I know we've got some engineering folk listening in, so I'm gonna have to apologize in advance. I'm gonna use some terms you're gonna find offensive. I'm gonna use the words ITIL, data government, data management, data governance, data management. I'm sorry, uh, it had to be said. So why uh, do organizations get really serious around compliance? That's because the breaches of data compliance is, is serious dollars. And we're seeing the, the amount of regulators grow. And it's not just in the banking industry, it's across lots of different industries as well. And what we're noticing is the power of the, the reach of those regulators is also extending. And it seems to hinder a lot around the use of data. So managing your data is crucial. So new regulatory compliance measures are coming in all the time. It may not be innovation, but it's additional change and topic innovation that you need to, to handle and, and have a group on. So building them in an agile and lean fa fashion is fundamental because that's actually a cost of business. And if you're not designing it for built for run, your support costs and total cost of ownership will also grow. So applying some good data management techniques through data reliability engineering will help you in that total cost of ownership. Now, I'm not going to go too much into standard SRE techniques because that the same applies in, in this in this case. Automation, self-healing, drift detection, room of toil, that, that's all that's all a given. More importantly, observability. Now we can't talk about SRE without talking about observability. So the same is true for DRE. However, the actions you need to take based upon the events you're monitoring and you want to fire off can actually tr can trigger some very complex events that when you're talking about large numbers of data jobs. So observability needs to go past the golden four uh, metrics of like availability, latent, latency, throughput, and yield. Yes, um, you, you need more than that. So when using event data to drive actions such as self-healing, you need to be aware of the other consequences and, and monitor those as well. For example, some jobs are very time critical. If you miss your window, then it, 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 you need to be thinking around like se se uh, sequencing and a whole bunch of other issues as well. And that's why your job, data jobs, for instance, must be item potent. In my experience, failures rarely tend to happen conveniently end of one batch job or a particular job or some easy milestone. They just crash wherever that bad data or corruption happens. So you need to be able to run that job in a way that it can be automated. The last thing I know I want is some sleep deprived person at 2am in the morning fumbling around a data set, partially understanding what the business use of the data is, trying to get data flowing again. And that is why data management and the governance controls have to be first class citizens. And more importantly, thought and design of what are your service level indicators for those controls have are because they need to be first class citizens. So where do we start? Let's go back to the fundamentals. Let's go back into our SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. It wouldn't be an SRE discussion without them. So look, I, I think Yuen did a great job explaining before about this breakdown from working backwards. But I'm gonna, again, steer this an example and, and steer them towards data, make them applicable to data. So, and because importantly, the customer can be not an external customer, it might be another part of the business, especially if you're a data provider you're gonna be offering a service. So typically you're gonna to need to have that agreement or contract because the people you're giving the data to, they need to know what that is, what the service is, how do they consume it, when it arrives, when it's available, uh, how to respond to an incident, uh, what happens if it's delayed, how to know if it's delayed. So those, because those consumers need to have a plan of actions that they need to take should you breach your SLA. And that, that's basically what the service level agreement is trying to establish. So think of it as a contract, that's what, what I tend to do. But in order to have confidence that your SLAs can be honored, you need to understand how to measure performance. And this is where the service level objectives really come into play. What is the acceptable level of failures or acceptable, acceptable tolerance level of errors? Do you know that? You need to measure that before you can commit to your SLA. 
So have you measured in confidence in these performance indicators? So in my experience, having a sound understanding of your organization's risk appetite and data management plan is critical to make sure that you're not inadvertently breaching that, that risk appetite. So for the platform and application, it's pretty straightforward, right? But in the data space, you need to know who's consuming your data and for what purpose. Uh, you might have constructed your data pipelines for exploratory analytical purposes. So how much trust do you actually place in the accuracy of data? Your data outputs might be repeatable and reliable, but what about the validity? If they're going to use that to do data-driven events or decisioning, is it valid? So this brings us to service level indicators. So what exactly do you intend to measure in order to have confidence in the performance attributes that you're defining for your service and more importantly what you're defining for your data so let's have a look at a high level example oh i've gone past one sorry can you go back one sorry Yun. thank yep. you yep. sorry we're, we're, uh the demo gods don't like us because yun's on a window and i'm on a mac uh, and and the key strokes are not coordinating between us thank you so a high level example so um, I, I shortened it down a little bit uh, just to have the SLO, so SLA, SLO, and SLI. So I'm going to use an example from the data space. I'm going to focus on a hot topic in the FSI, the financial institutions uh, space right now, and that's AML. So AML generally takes inputs from different uh, systems, such as core banking, payments, CRM, probably a data mart or more. So you're going to have a whole bunch of SLOs, like performance measurements on your platform. And that will be your like availability, your latency, your throughput. And you'll have that in your batch jobs, in your event streams, in your APIs. But what about the data? This is the important part. You need to measure the performance objectives of data itself. For example, some examples I just put out here was fresh data. Uh, when was the last time your data was refreshed? So data can move. And again, this is, will be happening in upstream systems you've got no control of, but you need to monitor it because it can move real time, intraday, daily, weekly, monthly, ad hoc. What's acceptable? Are you the first to know when the data is no longer fresh? Another ac uh, aspect is of performance of data is completeness. And this is important. So if you're building a data asset and it's built from three or four different data sources, sources, what are the critical data elements from of which of them is required to mark the end data asset as complete or mark it as good enough? And that's a really important factor to think about when you're in data is because you might be breaching an overall SLO for the sake of non-essential data. So let's say you only need 75% of that data asset to actually go and generate the report. The rest is just enrichment. Knowing that means that, and, you, and that's held up in some other system, knowing that difference makes, makes all the difference because you have flow on effects for downstream systems. So as you can see, these SLOs can also measure data management controls. And I think this is important. I think a lot of people don't understand this. You have controls within your data, you're thinking around an SRE approach where you're automating the observability of these, you're building those controls in. And the beauty of this is come audit time, and you can just pull the logs to show you have the controls and make life a lot easier. I, I, I personally, I, I wish I've had that in my previous jobs. So this is ITIL gives you a framework for the outcomes you should be addressing for when it comes to run of, of services. Data governance and data management principles will help you understand how to measure performance of your data pipelines. And when you're understanding that, defining your SLIs will become a lot easier and a lot clearer. For example, to measure the SLO for data accuracy, you can have SLIs that measure statistical profiling. So uh, are the transaction amounts and reconciliations within the prescribed variance or, or, or error tolerances as well? Very important. Now we're going to talk a bit around downstream systems. And they're important. Why are they important? Because, as I mentioned before, and, and as Yun showed in his diagram as well, that uh, sometimes you, you're relying even external parties for your particular data. So understanding uh, what's happening in upstream system is, is really important to be first to know. So this is actually an example of an operational resiliency dashboard we built for one customer. Uh, we track job dependencies. Uh, and then flow then those job dependent lineage right on. So uh, down, downstream that was to as far as the boundary could allow us to go. Uh, so that the team were actually clear when an incident happened on a particular job, what were the downstream impact? Uh, it's hard to tell from this in animation, but that, that's what we're clicking through to demonstrate that. One of the SLOs have been breached and the team will be able to see what will be impacted 
if you don't resolve the incident within the prescribed SLA. And that, that's, that's, that's all the, the difference around speed. Okay, and speed is, is vitally important. So this next slide I want to talk a bit about is around those new to maybe DevOps and SRO. I, I don't know how many people, <laughs> if they're under a rock and don't understand what mm -hmm. DevOps and SRE are, but I think there's some people joining us that are probably trying to still come to terms around uh, a traditional way, model and uh, operational system to, to new ways of working. I, I actually see them very complementary. Um, I just wanted to highlight here that uh, a lot of the outcomes that DevOps wants, SRE actually achieves. And they're, they're really based upon what ITIL was designed to achieve. So when you think about it, ITIL is around um, basically getting you to think around how to design your service for run, how to get it ready for run, that service transition, and then actually run it. Um, look, based upon the comments, uh, I didn't have time, but I was actually wanted to extend it out, make it better and actually put like a, what's called a DM BOC view for this. And that's, that's sort of the data governance view around that, how that fits in. Um, I just ran out of time, but if people are interested, leave some comments and if I get enough people, I'll, I'll make sure I complete it. So after ITIL came in, got us to consider around those particular things, then came along Agile, but Agile never really considered run. It was from, it was like from idea to deploy, not run. And DevOps was born out of the necessity to plug that gap. Kind of started with the infrastructure, deploying infrastructure, but then made its way into to the software development. And it's really, when you talk about like DevOps and ITIL, it's frameworks and principles. But then Google came up with SRE and actually took that the next step further because a lot of people fumbled about like I, I know myself I spent a few years as a consultant in DevOps and it was really really hard to get it working in the right way but Google's SRE actually gave us some hard practices to put in place to, to fill the gaps and, and, and make it complete where we we can actually go into organizations and and put a, a team together with and have defined outcomes and, and meet those outcomes and the best thing they're all measurable which is really really important. So, and that was really to do, Google did that because they were managing like at scale systems. From my personal experience, the uh, like service transition was a key element. Uh, and I, and I, I, why I'm really passionate around DRE is because I think that is still probably overlooked in lots of organizations. So we have SRE, but I think we need to investigate and, and explore a bit more in DRE because it gives a bit more attention to the reasons of complexity and data that I spoke a bit about earlier. These data jobs need to be built for run, and that's that service transition part. We need to make sure that it's, it's getting built in. Uh, that last box I've got there, item potent and two phase mutations. That's actually, if you go to the Google, I think it's the workbook, uh, they give some patterns around that. I'm, I'm really passionate about this point. Uh, and again, something that's a bit different to sort of normal applications where you make jobs like, uh, sorry, applications immutable. Uh, when you're talking about data flows, you very rarely move data from A to B. You mutate the data. So if you want your job to be item potent, you need actual patterns so that you can actually address that mutation. So the end to end job is item potent. I, again, I, I've still got PTSD from some of the trauma I had to go through for not uh, having this in place. So if you're not manager out there, I highly stress, do not let any jobs get into production unless they're item potent. So data ops, um, I, I was, hesitant to bring another concept in, and I'm only gonna like spend a little bit of time on there just to bring awareness of this. Uh, we will no doubt do another webinar on data ops in the very near future. Um, I think it has a place though, because when you talked about, you mentioned it, something very critical early, uh, early on the piece. Uh, we all have this data within our organization and it's locked within silos in different organizations and you really need to unlock that in order to really get some good innovation from different departments in your organization. But data ops is a way of putting an agile capability of a top of your data competencies. So I look at data ops as a form of innovation itself. Though you apply your DRE practices when developing data ops, but you really need to promote that culture around democratization of data, getting the data out of data silos so that you can actually make it available for benefit. And you may not have a benefit, but another organization, part of your organization does. And you, and what I'm finding is you, you tend, to be, tend to be addressing the same struggles uh, as when you do put in your an SRE practice or DRE practice, or even move towards a DevOps culture. So if you're sharing it, because remember, if you're sharing that data with, to someone else and making it available, 
you're going to have those same, you need to address those same issues around your data be, to be accurate, timely and complete. Okay, so this brings us to the point of the presentation where uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug for Contino. <laughs> so at Contino, we've developed a, a, a reliability enterprise transformation maturity assessment. So basically, we've got over 136 different points of data where we go in to identify SRE improvement areas for customers. So we collect this through workshops, uh, interviews with engineers and management as well. At the end, it's not just uh, uh, like a, a maturity rating. We also give treatment plans and a recommendation for a path forward. In fact, they've been so useful that we've personally developed a few model, models that we, we go in pre-bake, depending upon where an organization is in their structure uh, and their maturity and their transformation journey as well. And I'll talk a bit about the uh, a few of those models coming up very shortly as well. Another one we have developed is in the data, and this is probably where we we'll do another webinar, is the data ops maturity assessment. I, I think it's important to, to highlight this while we talk about data reliability engineering, because just like SRE, you need to have a certain capability of engineering, uh, like uh, maturity a, a about you. Uh, you need to have this same view in the data reliability engineering space as well. So what are our nine points we, we measure? We talk about culture. Why is it important? We need to understand if it's a bottom down or, or no, sorry, top down or bottom up led initiative. So how much organizational change management do you need to be thinking about here to make it a success? Uh, strategy, what's your data strategy? What's the end goal? Is it aligned with other key initiatives? Value assurance, how are you measuring success? What should, what should you measure? That's an important part, it ties in with SLIs. Tools and technology, uh, that's an easy one, pretty straightforward. Uh, regulatory and security requirements. So do you have clarity on those requirements and are they actually aligned with other key organizational units? For, for example, one we recently did, you've got your cybersecurity team, but you've got uh, people looking at security in the data sense, in the privacy sense, and they were not aligned at all. Pretty important. Uh, we talk about, uh, we assess, sorry, development automation. So are you following best practices? What about your analytics consumption? So are you actually using your data assets you're being developed? And how do you know? Data and, da sorry, data, and data models, uh, are the structures you're building understandable and are they fit for analytical purposes? Or are you gonna have to find yourself when you come to your analytics uh, strategy and purpose, uh, you'll find that the data structures are not fit for purpose. And lastly, organizational and talent. Does your team have the data literacy to be successful? What about their technical capabilities as well? So having an independent partner come and do this for you uh, means they're dedicated to deliverable and help reduce some of the bias in the findings given that's cross organizational uh, venture. So this actually brings us to uh, the, our SRE op models. I'm, I'm going to try it, Yun. Yes, worked. So SRE op model, this is our embedded model. So we have here the, uh, and this came out of one of our assessments we did, and we realized that it's, we apply this in other areas that it works as well. So it's probably best suited to when you want to maximize results given a very compressed time frame. So you're dipping your toe in the water here, testing it out. So in this model, Contino will work with the development team and we'll create a cross collaborative squad comprised of all the actors that you'd have in any cross functional squad. Uh, and we basically pick a dummy feature, put in production, uh, we come up with a workflow uh, to put that into application uh, and we really want to ship it as quick as possible without as little as human um, and manual effort as, as possibly that we can do within that short period of time. And at the end of that, it actually gives us our epics and stories and showcases that we use to do the next venture, whatever they may be. So some customers choose not to continue on, they too hard or some may actually go into, let's say our next one which is our special interest group. And our, this, the reason we call that special interest group is because we've used this from the data we've obtained from the assessment. So we, we've gone in, done the assessment, looked at all the different maturity pillars for SRE. And from there, it's important because we pick the two teams which are the most suitable for upskilling. So we wanna make like work with the teams where we know we can make it successful. Uh, we embed a continual engineer in each of those two teams. And then through like pair programming and coaching, uh, we'll help these teams implement the application instrumentation. So it'll, it'll depend upon your organization, but 
usually tools like Prometheus and Grafana and might use some, some are using Splunk and Dynatrace. So, but we'll, we'll work with you on those particular tools. Lastly, uh, the, the one model that we've rolled out very recently in a, in a quite a large bank, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to name it, so I won't, uh, is our center of enablement. So this is the last model I'll, I'll share today and you can always reach out to us to get some more information. Uh, but this is more geared for our larger style engagements. So again, we've, probably, we've done the assessment and we'll work with the customer to implement some anchoring some principles here. So the principles of the approach are, uh, how do we govern the creation and growth of SRE teams? Um, what's the other one? Uh, upskilled engineers and management into becoming true SRE teams. So we immerse new SRE teams from start to finish. And the reason we do that is we want to demonstrate what good looks like through engineering excellence. Uh, we we'll work with them to how to scale these practices throughout the organization. And most importantly, how and what to measure progress for the performance of the SRE teams themselves, because that, that, that's vitally important. So to give you a, a view of what that looks like, um, you can see that it, it, it takes a bit of time to set that up, but it's got the, the characteristics of, of, of most teams where you've got a full cross-functional squad um, and basically underpinning the output and the maturity of those teams, we're, we're bringing back and anchoring back into that center of enablement. So we've got those standard patterns and practices and toolings and decisions from, and then more importantly, there's feedback loop cycles that we generate as well. So depending upon what's working or, or, or uplifts the practices that goes into our decision register uh, and that gets rolled out into other teams as well. So look, um, I highly, uh, I think after seeing this webinar, I highly, if you want to see the more detail of like putting, like what that could look like as well, highly recommend looking at the other uh, SRE webinar I've referenced a few times, Boost Your Apps with an SRE Approach, that uh, Carlos uh, hosted the other week. Uh, you can find that on our Contino YouTube channel as well. Um, so, and I, look, he had to wrestle with the demo gods in that one, and I think he did a good job to recover from, from that. So I think that puts us on to our next slide. Our key takeaways. You want, do you want to kick that off? Yeah, sure. And think on just uh, following up on what you mentioned about um, Carlos's deep dive into the technical aspects of SRE with boosting your app. There is also a very um, kind of relevant innovation uh, webinar by Ben Saunders in the UK as well, where he talks about the imperative of innovating in, in a crisis such as COVID. Um, so I think we, our webinar today is actually bringing uh, both, both of them together in a way where we talk about innovation, it's definitely an imperative to stay ahead of the creative disruption as well as your competitors. Uh, the fact that you know innovation is much more than just technology, it requires you to start with the customer, but also having that sort of value string uh, to work backwards and then perhaps going beyond your traditional boundaries of your product um, and your channels. And continued innovation has to be built on the foundation of reliability to be able to satisfy the customer SLA, which is then measured by your SLO, which then is measured by an aggregate of your SLA plus your vendors SLA, uh, SLAs. Yeah. Okay. So you want to go start with your takeaways? Did you have that one? Yes. And so, oh, sorry, you did my one. So, but look, the, if I was the takeaway points, if software is in the world, then data is a gravy on top. You need to give it the importance it deserves. Plus, gravy is young. So don't <laughs> drift into failure. Be first to know. Uh, having observability on the right controls and the objectives. So, so I hope that may break down on data itself. Uh, sticks that you need to be looking at that as well. And data governance is your friend. Get familiar with DMBOC. Look, don't have to be an expert at it, but it can help you identify some of the gaps you might have. Uh, and use SLOs to drive the right data management culture. So again, you've got an opportunity to, to engineer some of these controls rather than having a different risk team or compliance team and audit team or going to support. You can automate a lot of these controls so that you've got and if you probably the DRE and SRE approach, not only observability, you're going to have those in logs with metrics as well. So they're the take home points that I really stress that you, you walk away with and, and remember. And 
I guess in terms of questions, uh, keep, keep the questions coming if you have any. Uh, we have one question so far from Chamara. Um, great session so far, you and the Michael. And I think this one's definitely for you, Michael. Same for the warning uh, on the language. Uh, you might honest opinion, governance is not evil. All right, it becomes evil <laughs> only when it is not named data-driven governance. Uh, I've been following Gerald's post on AWS governance and compliance. It's a great step towards named data-driven governance. Yeah. Oh, look. Uh, let me respond to that. I, I'm with you on that. Uh, it's I. I remember a few times. I couldn't believe I was a DevOps consultant. And I was like I was advocate for ITIL and and data governance at the same time. Look, I think that um, it's it's needed. To me, you know, I, I see that people say bureaucracy is bad. Bureaucracy is a way of decentralized management. So had it, it's around creating guardrails so that you can give autonomy and push decision rights down to where the power is and where the knowledge is. But with with guardrails, I think what's happened in industry is ITIL is a perfect example, and I've seen some of the data governance uh, um, implementations. Uh, it's like scar tissue because something went wrong. They they've taken non engineering approach, non lean approach, and just whacked like a band aid effect over it, and that's where a lot of people are like uh, like have scar tissue and trauma from that. But I'm with you. It's not evil. Uh, I, I just know that a lot of engineers. Uh, uh, a lot of technical people do find it evil. I think they just got a different view on it. I, I think they need to educate themselves a bit more. Yeah, I think um, on that, it's a great follow-up question from Chamara. Is um, is have we have we thought about creating a discussion forum to engage any participants on an ongoing basis? It would be a great way to promote some collaboration and also drive some lead generation through this. Yeah, look, I, I think so. Um, for us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> could, could, could be. Look, I'm not, I'm not sales, so I'm not worried about that. But like for me, uh, I, I, in the data space, uh, like I've got some ex-colleagues and we've discussed this many a time. We still catch up on a regular basis and, and chat about like some of the, the, the bad things that still still happen as well. I, I think it's really important. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I would like that. I think it's good for people to share uh, and also, the it's not just the bad, so it's the positive story. So, um, uh, was in Dave Coombs from uh, Tyro. So I was I was at the Open Banking Summit with him, and we were talking around data pipelines in Tyro. Like they they actually had some good practices of putting around their data pipeline data flows. So there's some good stories out there. It's people doing the right things, got the right approach. Yeah, I think like having an open discussion to share the good and the bad, and and get some insights. And like I just I said before. Identif knowing what SLI is, is is absolutely critical, but to do that, you've got to work backwards. You've got to understand performance metrics. So I think we should have discussion around how do you measure performance of data? Uh, yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. Yeah, I think um, just to reinforce on Michael's point, I think lead generation is not really our aim here. It's definitely to share the good stuff from the community. And um, on that, we actually have about uh, 40 different meetups that we run in, and on various topics. and you know, SIE could be one of them. I, I would, we would definitely keep you posted. Uh, the, so next question would be, uh, would be great if we can share the presentation. So we definitely will do that to all the attendees today. You would get the presentation. Um, a question from Mary, what approach would you suggest for data reliability in test environments for passing automated tests? Yeah, oh, that's that's always, that's always been the hardest thing to do automated testing in, in the data space. Look. It's it's really you can still do you can hundred percent do it right it, it's it's complex and I think that where it doesn't happen enough is because I, I don't know what's happened over the last decade but when I was a software engineer like I was very proficient in databases like uh, it's evil now but like writing stored procedures you know what I mean so it, but looking at the data and, and and doing those assertion tests of data. Uh, it, you can definitely do it. I think the issue is it slows it down and we don't have uh, great tools to make that quick. And I think that's probably the gap in, in the data space. So that look, uh, one of the examples I gave was statistical profiling, right? You could, you could apply that same logic into like a unit test uh, so that you, you, you're passing data from one like API or one call to another. Um, you'd have to dummy up some data. And I think the other thing what makes it a bit harder to do is is the actual test data so um it, it's it's hard to generate all the different types of permutations that you'll get in a production system into your non-production system and sometimes 
if you sanitize your data, you actually eliminate the testing uh, criteria. So you, you basically sanitize the data uh, and you tend to lose some of, some of the um, issues as well. Look, it's a complex one, definitely doable. Uh, I, I think that you need to invest uh, into that. And I, I'm a firm believer that it's the JCO. If you invest in the unit tests in your data, you invest in uh, a data management tool so that you can actually create data as opposed to the old fashioned way of like taking a copy of production data and taking a subset, moving it across and sanitizing it. Like we're, we're, as, as an engineer, <clears throat> you're writing the code and you're writing product system. You should have a test harness that actually produces your test data. So again, if I'm looking around, if I want like an immutable test environment, uh, that's part of my code, right? If I'm generating my data it, as I build and provision my environment. Yep. So one question from Nick is um, very relevant. What is the leanest and fastest approach for delivery of an SRE practice in a large complex organization where proving SRE is essential for scaling the practice out? Yeah, look, that's, that's well, I, I, I'm going to give you two flavors. One, one is what's your funding? So, and, and this is, it all comes back to fund. Those who know me a long time, I always go back to funding. All right, so it's follow the money. That's how things happen. Um, so if you've got limited funding, what I would recommend is, is that you do the very first approach, the embedded approach where you get uh, uh, within your control, uh, someone, who, you have to have someone with experience. Like I, I, I tried to set up a practice a couple of times. Uh, first couple failed because I just didn't have the, the knowledge. I couldn't, I couldn't train anyone up that to, to actually just run it. You need someone with experience to do it. So the first embedded model, get someone who's got experience, uh, who can sit with the team, get a, like a dummy application and just do it. By doing that, you, you may fail, but you, you understand and uh, what the barriers are going to be. And from that, you'll formulate your, your, your epics and your backlog around, and you apply that to the next team you actually want to uh, roll that out to. Uh, I, I, would pick, I wouldn't start with data if you're starting that off. I would definitely start with an application or platform where the, the definition of SLIs are gonna be easier to ascertain. Therefore, your error budget will be easier to construct. Uh, and then your CRC pipeline uh, will be easier to sort of marry up the two. Uh, I, I would definitely do that way. But if you've got budget to do this, uh, and it's not a plug for us, definitely get us in to do the maturity assessment. Uh, and that way we make a plan around what area we, and take two teams. And, and important for that is having that, that center of enablement is, it is organizational change management. Like you are going to, if you want a true cross-functional squad, and if you're in an old type of system where the operations are sitting in a different team, you, you need to break that organizational structure down and you need to get that, that, that buy-in. So it's, um, it's, it's not quick, but it's definitely worthwhile. And if you get to the point where you don't have ops in there, it's still going to go over a wall. Look, I, I could probably share some other models, which uh, from my experience, there's a, something I had to do. And, and I'll, I'll give you another example uh, very quickly we still had to keep like a level one type of snow, like a, a help desk scenario because there's so much technical debt. There's so much like things, so many things breaking the amount of incidents. You could never give that to an SRE team because that like the whole SRE team is like 50, it should be 50% like ops and 50% like continuous improvement and remove toil. They would be doing like 5% remove toil and 90% incident management. So yeah, in some organizations you need to sort of like, shelve that that support and you've got to tackle level two level three support together look there's different ways and I, I recommend if you truly want to do it having the maturity assessment but not just doing that you need that with a treatment plan of where to start and you're going to start in one organizational unit so like if, i know where you're from nick uh, but uh, i'll use bank because i've probably got the most experience in banks and you probably want to start maybe in like the the digital area you know or the mobile area something like that and build the practice up, get it working, what good looks like, then you get confidence. When you build confidence and you get a return on that business return and realization, uh, then you, you get more trust, you get more funding. And then when you get more funding, then you can start rolling it out. You gotta, you gotta prove it works. Yeah, I think on that, on that funding aspect, it's, it's definitely one of the prerequisites of the SRE approach is to have the right executive sponsorship. Um, yeah. And oftentimes you see in the organization where Michael, touch on the technical debt, right? Where, where does technical debt come from? People, good engineers don't just come on day one and start building technical debt. It's because 
there's a lot of pressure from the business to ship features, right? The business is an organization who understands the imperative to innovate fast, will always ask for features. But you can't keep building features and not worry about reliability. And what happens is over time, reliability becomes an afterthought. Um, and sometimes you actually have to put a break on the features to actually build up your reliability to a point where it's acceptable before you kind of let, let, let the gas on the features again. And to do that, you need the sort of right level of uh, executive sponsorship to say, look, you know, we're going to focus on reliability because of based on our blameless post-mortem, we know that we are not satisfying the SLOs. Therefore, we must kind of divert the energy, the 50% over into the reliability um, and operation side of things. And, and also kind of on the ground up perspective, once you have the right uh, executive sponsorship, SRE must be engineers, right? They are there to do engineer work. They're not there to do operation work. So it's kind of balancing. Yes, you need to focus on reliability, but you also do it from an engineering perspective. So you must kind of be hiring yeah. the best engineers, um, the, the people who have done it before that, that Michael has mentioned. And yeah, that's kind of where hard. we can also yeah. help. Yeah, it's hard. I, I'm, I've viewed different places I've worked. Even it's so hard to even just get a hardening sprint in, let alone like stop changes of features like for a few weeks, because uh, like that we promised the business that we must ship on this date. Like that's what you, that's your challenge. So funding and and, and exec sponsorship. Yeah, and at the end of the day, right? It's just it's it's about having those metrics and the sort of the dashboard that we can build around um, resiliency of all the overall vendors and all the systems. We can actually build a business case to justify the business. Well, we can build all these features, but if the site is down, then you know this, that, that's actually the most important feature, and that equates with this much in dollar revenue loss. Right? So, um, so you know, there's actually a lot of good discussions. And um, apologies for running over time. I think uh, you know what we can do uh, after this is obviously share the decks as well as uh, perhaps we can put together whether it's a meetup group or LinkedIn group. Um, to, to actually keep these um, discussions going because I think it's, um, it's, it's very much needed at times like this. And um, it's, a, it's a niche topic as well where a lot of organizations are actually exploring, but they actually have nowhere, no idea where to start. Yeah. Yeah. In terms Happy of organization innovation and, and site reliability as well as data reliability engineering. So. Cool. Um, so I think. Um, that's all the questions. Well, thanks, thanks everyone for your time. Um, definitely kind of reach out to either Michael or myself if you have any more questions. Um, if your organization is going down a similar path, um, yeah, definitely reach out and we'd love to help and share ideas. Yeah, absolutely. It's been fun. Thanks, Yun. Thanks, Michael. So, it's, okay. Thank you for everyone uh, office, taking time out in your office maybe your, a few minutes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye bye.